Good evening. I'd like to call the Thursday, December 16th, 2021, Board of Education meeting to order at 7 p.m. Roll call. Chairman Papa Holzer. Vice Chair Nafria. Here. Secretary Sienna. Here. Jim Balsamo. Here. Zachary Canada. Here. Cynthia Rice. Salute to the flag, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, are there any visitors' comments limited to the agenda? Yes. Mr. Savasino, go ahead. Yep, could you just state your name and address for the record, please? Bill Savasino, 77 Drive. And my comments tonight are going to be continued in a good and bold. And first of all, I'd like to thank the Board of Remember me from the thin parties working in the Board of Vancouver. I haven't been here for a couple of years, and obviously, because of the COVID, the people have had their challenges, and you answer the call, so I commend you for that. Uh, the other reason I'm here tonight, Terry, uh, if you could pass that around. Sure. Yeah, uh, a month ago was Veterans Day, and you guys always did a good job for Veterans Day. I tuned in the last part's meeting just to see what was done with, if anything. And it was pleasant to uh, really find out that uh, you did do something. And of course, I found that the next day we were a little, a little uh, picture in, in, uh, in the sound. Uh, one of our veterans is here to accept it for big thank you cards. And uh, that's his Gary Tuziak. He's grown on in the high school. And at uh, our meeting, which was two weeks ago, he brought the the thank you cards in, and they're in that picture we took with uh, the rest of our veterans at the meeting. So it's a, a nice big thank you for, for what you uh, what you do every year. Unfortunately, the uh, last two years it's been so long that uh, I'm going to continue. I know Mr. Canada, uh, at the end of last uh, month's meeting, sort of uh, uh, struck up a conversation with what the other, besides the high school, what the other classes did. And unfortunately, because of the audio, I didn't catch it all, but I know everybody, everybody did. So, so again, thank you very much. Uh, down the road, we, now we're only nine guys in that picture there, so we don't have enough uh, exposure. And we're, we're trying to figure out something else, even if we have to bring it back. Next year, I'm going to turn the lunch and I'm going to So I'm going to give that to Mr. Stafford so he gets the picture back to Chris Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. We are, we are looking, hopefully, next year to get back to oh, yeah. having all the veterans back in the school, starting off and doing the breakfast and the lunch and, and having the veterans come in. It's such a special time. It's the most important thing we do to honor our vets. You mentioned Mr. Canada, who served in the armed forces. I have a son who's a Marine, so I, I, I can't thank you enough. So, we're, well, we're... Thank you again. I, myself, used to like to go to Jerome Harris and go to the school and high school and get the bed for both. <laughs> yeah. Looking forward to it. You don't have to eat dinner that night. You're starting <laughs> breakfast, you go right to lunch. That's an easy night, right? It looks like I'm missing you. No. <laughs> Thank you. And go Michigan. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, that's all yours. I'm uh, McKenna. It's all yours. Sorry, McKenna. Um, today I'm the only one here because we already had a basketball <laughs> game. But uh, we have three nice announcements. Uh, students in each grade were provided store recognition awards on November 24th during the shortened school day prior to Thanksgiving. Peer nominations were used to identify the recipients. Students were provided letters with MBHS personnel visiting classrooms to present the students with their letters in the presence of staff and students. Next up. Throughout Connecticut, high school winter sports started the week of November 29th. 
For MBHS, this includes girls and boys basketball, ice hockey, a team member participating on the girls hockey team at Hamden High, co-op boys swimming, indoor track, and under the CIAC umbrella of student activities, fencing. Lastly, we have the MBHS Winter Concert took place last night, December 15th, with staggering performances for the instrumental and choral groups. Parents and family members were allowed to attend on a limited basis with ticket requests and seating arrangements completed prior to the event. Mr. Philippides and Ms. Berte organized the event under the direction of Music Department Chair, Ms. Zolp. Very nice. So who do we co-op with for swimming? Do we do Brantford or North Haven? I, uh, this season it's North Haven. It's, okay. Nice. Thank you. Do you know any swimmers in North Haven? I, I do know a couple. Um, <laughs> it's boy season this season, and, and we actually have a female in North Haven that's co op It's the only sport that if a female participates in a female-based sport during the fall season, they can compete as a swimmer during the swimming season with a boy swim. She does. Oh, that's all interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's... So she's the only female on the boy team? I have to check the roster, but from our school. Wow. She participates in the volleyball in the fall. So she plays volleyball. That's also. cool. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Great opportunity. Mm -hmm. And we thank North Haven for allowing us to, to call mm -hmm. up with them. Kudos. Thank you. You're free to go, McKenna. I'm sure you can. Bye, McKenna. Bye, Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Happy, happy holidays. Thank you. Happy holidays. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to move on to the consent agenda. This is the first time we're using the consent agenda. So it still has everything, as you see, broken down. It's just one motion as opposed to all the individual motions. But if there's ever anything that you want pulled out of the consent agenda for whatever reason, then you just say so. And we'll do that. Motion um, No, the, the motion can go now and all this will get approved. So, so here's, so we, oh, you mean to pull it out? Right, right. We will pull it out now because, oh, okay. because there's a motion right here to approve the consent right. agenda, the December, December 16, 2021 Board of Education meeting as submitted. So once that's motioned, the motion's made, second, voted on, it's done. So if there's anything anybody wanted to pull out, you do it now. Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion. Do you have to see what's here? No, because it's posted. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda of the December 16th, 2021 Board of Education meeting as submitted. Any discussion? Do you want to ask any questions about any of it? Feel free. Right, so we're approving the minutes as well? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We're approving the minutes. The so we're pretty much approving A to yes. G, correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Correct. So that's also Zach to permanent project, Beth to permanent project, Shauna as the alternate, Zach to pension, and then Beth to pension because those have to be voted on and then sent to the town council for approval. And those are the ones we forgot to do last week. Correct. Right? Okay. We, made, we, we, we placed we everybody on the committees, we but we didn't actually make a motion. Okay. Okay, then we'll do a roll call, Mayor. Sure. Vice Chair Nafrio? Yes. Secretary Sienna? Yes. Jan Bolsama? Yes. And Zachary Canada. Uh, yes. Okay. That's the superintendent's report. Okay, thank you. And not, not that I want to go back in the agenda, but I do want to thank the uh, Jerome Harrison PTO for their generous donation for a rock climbing wall mm -hmm. um, that will be installed. Uh, February. When? In February. February. Okay, and uh, all of the youngsters will have the opportunity, similar to what the middle school does with the climbing, mm -hmm. low climbing wall there at the building, so that's great for the kids. Uh, <clears throat> the board briefs are there. Yep. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to either send them to us or ask the administrators. Uh, we're obviously very busy at this time of the year leading up to the holiday break. Um, there's been a number of external things that have uh, happened i keep you informed with uh events that rise to the level of something i want you to be aware of and i sent you an updated uh letter that went to all parents regarding a national TikTok um, situation that unfortunately uh, has caused a great deal of emotion uh, throughout the country um, i think we did a, a nice job cooperating with our, our local police our 
security teams and what we're going to do. I'm not really going to go into a lot of detail, uh, but I assure you that the communication has been strong and, and we've been really proactive with uh, how we're handling this. Uh, so if there's no questions on that, I'll keep moving. Uh, the school calendar is also attached. Uh, we made a couple of adjustments um, with the calendar because we uh, thought that we were going to have to adjust around the, per the um, high school building project, but we did not have to. So that gets us back into school early next year on the 30th. That gets us out uh, earlier next year as well. So I think that's a good thing. Um, so I'll need a motion to accept that, that calendar. Uh, from the board. Second. Okay, any discussion? Is that a typical calendar? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. that's that's pretty much our work. It satisfies. Kids, the kids start on a Wednesday, so it gives them usually three days to adjust, and then the following week is Labor Day, so they get a four-day week. So it just sort of breaks them in. And we usually do those two professional development days in um, November because we're off for election day. So rather than bring the kids in on Monday and out on Tuesday, mm -hmm. we just do professional development, give the kids a long weekend. And we did that this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, so it's, it's just pretty much the norm of what we do. Good. February, we used to have a full week break, but we uh, went back to a long weekend, which seems to work out better because if you have a tough winter and it feels like you're out of school one day every week because of snow. So they didn't really need to be out in February, and we have our full break in April. We're out June 9th. Really, really nice. Well, no games. Well, yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. So it is typical. Okay, then all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Vaughn now for the financial report. Okay, thank you. So I did hand the packets out. You'll notice the first page is a draft version of our budget um, calendar for 22-23, so we're at that time of year again already. Um, the dates in blue are the dates that I want you to uh, look at tonight. And I did not put a time down. I figured the best would be to have you decide the time, what fit be best with everyone's schedules. Uh, this calendar does follow the uh, template that we've been using for the past few years. February 3rd would be a Thursday, the 9th would be Wednesday, and somewhere between the 10th and the 16th. Don't you usually like pick a date between the 10th and the 16th and have it just in case? Because as time goes on, people's calendars fill up, and then this one couldn't make it or that one couldn't make it. Do you think we should pick a date? So people can plan around that, and then if it gets canceled, it's a bonus for us. Yeah, because what if it snows this day? You know what I mean? So, but to just say between February 10th and 16th, As needed. by the time we need, I know, but by the time that we may need it, it might be too right. late to pick a night where it's convenient, you know, where it works for everybody. So I think we should probably do it now, and then people can plan around it. Like I said, if it gets canceled and we don't need it, that's a bonus. Do it when? Six. That's a seven. Or sorry, seven. Yeah. Are you looking at a date between the tenth and the sixteenth? Yes. Okay. Date between the tenth and the sixteenth. Uh, sorry, Monday. We're talking right after here, right? February. Yep. 6th. No, no, no. No, this one we're going to do. Yes. Okay. Then this one's if needed, and this is an as needed, if needed. So, but to have a have a, a whole week there, you know, by the time we get to possibly sure. need that, people are going to have their schedules booked. So if we pick a date now, what? I would think we want it to do the following week rather than do it at the beginning. So like instead of the 10th and 11th, which is a Friday anyway, maybe the 15th, which is a Tuesday or the Wednesday. Is there a town council meeting? First and third. That would be a town council meeting. So oh. Okay. Do, do we need to avoid that, though? I I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, well, preliminary the, like that, we. Yeah, I don't that, think that's we wouldn't a bring problem. it to them. Yeah. I don't know. I didn't know if there was anything else that was going to be brought up with them. That's no, because we'll present everything. Yeah, because then we have time. to go present it to them. So. To them. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, if, if you want to do it the 16th, that's fine with me. The 15th or the 16th, what works for you guys? Yeah. Oh, right, because you have your meetings. Yeah. That's the standing meeting right. from yeah, the project. Yeah, so you can fine with me 15th or Okay, so do you want to pencil in the 15th and the 16th, just in case? And then they get canceled, they get canceled. Well, that's, that's the problem. That's why you're confusing you yourself. That's the next year's split now. Yeah. Yeah. So both February 15th and the 16th. Mm -hmm. we'll okay. Yeah. yeah. So we'll have those as backups. Okay. Do you want to set a time now, or do you want? Yeah, to? let's set a time. Okay. Um, I'm flexible. Shauna was like, she said later is normally bad for her, or I, I don't remember. If well, it's like, changed. And and I know you have a time. So what what works? Yeah. What works? Seven is the way. Seven, seven and seven works seven. for Shauna. Okay. okay. So we can do seven on the third. The 9th if needed, and the 15th and 16th if needed. The 9th is just an admin council meeting, so that does not involve the board. So we'll just put it in blue. Just okay. so you realize that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we'll cross that one off. Perfect. So we've got the 3rd, the 15th, and the 16th all at 7. Does that work? Okay. Good. Good, thank you. So moving on to the uh, finance. Correct. Right. And this is, yeah, we did one just in case it was okay. Okay, we good? sorry, Mark. That's yeah. okay, no problem. Okay, um, the finance report, really not much uh, new things to report on this time. The implementation of the new financial system is ongoing. We have actually uh, have a full, complete crosswalk of the chart of accounts now from the old financial system to the new financial system. It has been uploaded into the new program and what they're basically calling a sandbox version um, where we can go in and test things and have our trainer walk us through the different modules. Um, we are actually now in the process of going through all our accounts payable vendors, reviewing them, making any necessary changes, putting them into a spreadsheet and then we're going to provide those to the financial system company and they'll be uploaded into the system. We're trying to limit and clean the amount of data that we're putting mm -hmm. into the new system to avoid um, that makes sense. some of the inconsistencies mm -hmm. and errors that we're seeing now. Gym floor, the materials have been ordered but they have not all been received. So once they've been received, the work will uh, start. They'll be able to schedule and, and start uh, the new floor. We will begin um, a discussion to see if we can extend our contract with our current transportation vendor, hopefully next week. Um, and so we'll keep you posted on, on our progress with that. Perfect. As you just saw in the uh, draft version of the budget calendar, all buildings and departments need to have their 22-23 budget requests into our current financial system by January 4th. So it's really going to start to pick up steam now, this whole process. Our current year budget for 21-22, uh, right now we're, the district is in a, in a positive position, so that's great, Good. of course. Uh, not much different from, from last month. The health insurance line continues to decrease in the overage, so what happens is we budget for what we believe our district contribution is going to be for the year and then as the employees contribute on a bi-weekly bi basis to their health insurance we get those premiums and we apply them to the overage and then so by the end of the year uh, that should be um, at a zero. Do we ever have a problem with the health insurance? Well, I mean it's only what your second or third year but um as far as budgeting, um, let's just say you budget for X amount of people to have buyouts and then people don't have buyouts. Do we run into that problem a lot? I haven't seen that type of an issue okay. so far in, in my tenure here. Okay. Um, we've eliminated a lot of the buyout language. Yeah, we, we, we've cleaned up a lot up. so that we know, we have a better idea of who to count on mm -hmm. to have the buyout. We're requiring uh, annual forms now 
that the contract states they should have been electing for the buyout. Okay. And we okay. also keep spreadsheets of, of okay. you know, who has family single um, and two person coverage and try and calculate out what we think we're going to get for those contributions. Um, okay. You know, to, okay, to make it all work. Perfect. As I said last month, the workman's comp came in higher than what we had anticipated, so that will be a uh, budget transfer that I will need to do. I had hoped to have budget transfers for this meeting, but with the trainings uh, for the new financial system and a few other things that came to light, I just didn't get to it, so I will have that for you next month. The tent rental under Object 440, that is the tents that we are renting for the outdoor spaces. Um, that wasn't budgeted for last year in our general fund. It was actually um, covered by the cost of a grant. So I will need to transfer money into that line mm -hmm. okay. uh, to cover that. Mm -hmm. No change in the building improvement. Uh, most of the auger house repairs have been covered through the Fund 25. Mm -hmm. And um, the equipment, I don't believe there's any change in that line as well. Perfect. The tents, um, is that something we've been using a lot this year? Are we keep going to do it next year again? Or do we well, we, we've really narrowed it down to one school that's actually, I think, using the tents okay. uh, with frequency. It's for our youngsters at Jerome Harrison. Okay. Uh, so, unless I'm in driving by and I'm just so used to the tents. The other buildings, we do not have tents on the premise. They're gone everywhere. It's just your own. Okay. So, and it's a local company who's been wonderful to work with. And uh, when I started pricing these out 20 months ago, uh, the local vendor uh, was 50% uh, of what others were asking for. So it's been nice to work with a person mm -hmm. right here in North Brantford. Mm -hmm. So, but we are winding down and we're hoping by next year, these tents will be a right. thing of the past. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. right, I don't see any, any other questions? Red, I don't see any other red flags here. Everything looks good. And if you happen to see something later on, you know, Paul or... Line, maybe for the line item transfers. Could you send them to us a few days in advance? I can, yes. And that way, if anybody has any questions, they can send them back to you. Okay. And then it might make it, might make it a smoother process. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Moving along, curriculum instruction, strategic planning. At the last board meeting, we had a lengthy uh, presentation by Ms. Wooten and a number of updates. One of the things that was a part of the focus was the high school SAT. And there was a question asked um, by um, Ms. Holzer regarding the SAT and looking at more historical data with the SAT. And our administrators went back and um, took the charge to give you a better picture mm -hmm. of uh, percentiles of students who participate. Uh, their their scores over time and from the time they enter the high school to the time they, they exit the high school. So I thought, and Ms. Uden thought it would be a valuable opportunity just to spend a couple of minutes. It's only a few mm -hmm. slides, but just to take a look at that. So that being said, I'll say Mr. Ford is here. Uh, Rob Ford is our uh, district English coordinator here. He's been a, a high school um, teacher in North Brantford for several, several years and actually has won numerous awards. I'm going to embarrass you a little bit now, Mr. Ford, for um, his efforts in the coursework, not only the coursework that he teaches, but some of his writings and things that he's brought to North Brantford. So he's here as well to kind of speak to. He does a lot of the data crunching and a lot of the analysis, uh, not only at the high school, but through K-12 as well. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Rob, like Scott said, Rob is our uh, 612 VLA uh, coordinator, but our, our high school data team leader, too. The role that he's had for several years. He really gets all the SAT, the SAT information, he crunches it, he puts it in formats, got the data team you know, can kind of understand. We meet, every, we meet monthly, review it, and we break the data down per grade. 
um, historically, all the way down to per student, um, and we attack you know what we see there. So, um, and I think it's just important um, to look at our data over the last few years. Um, we know with the pandemic, as you know, Tracy has explained in, in the last couple of meetings, um, it's brought some unique challenges that we've never seen before. Um, so, to get a little perspective of, of where we've been, we went back to the last six years. Um, the reason we did that, and Rob can you know, explain to that, 2016 was the first year of the SAT that was redesigned. So the College Board kind of redesigned the SAT um, and made it more Common Core based. Um, so that's where we, we started our, our data from. So, you know, we only have, we have three succinct slides to look at, kind of get to the point. Um, and Rob can really speak to the growth aspect, which I think is um, critical um, when we look at, you know, like uh, Scott said, when our students arrive to us and then how they grow each year. So looking at the data, there's a couple things there um, that we haven't talked about before. One, the biggest one being a super score. So what a super score is, is, is students can, who take the SAT more than once and they take their best scores and combine it. So we know that the state reports out on the one day test that the schools take, and that's, that's kind of where our report card comes from. But our students are taking it more than that just one day. So when you see the super score, those are our averages of our students that, that are taking the SAT, and most students are taking it more than once. That's what gets reported to colleges. Um, and so it's a really important score. So while the state doesn't allow us to report that score out, they only want that one SAT day, which this year is March 29th, I think it's important to put down where our super scores are, because they're still our kids, and they're taking, you know, they're taking that same SAT in the same year. Um, and they're performing quite well. Um, if you look at the column, this still left that, that's the SAT day score over the last six years, and then the last column is with that state average. So math is up top, and then English-based reading and writing is on the bottom. Um, and as you can see, we're always right at or above state average, um, which, is, which is really important to know. The last couple of years due to the pandemic, um, you know, the state averages may be inflated in a sense, um, because there's many districts that didn't have the participation rate, like what we had. Um, and Tracy talked about that in her, in her presentation. Uh, for example, New Haven had a 57% participation rate. So, you know, the less students taking the test, um, you know, those average scores may be inflated. Um, but we're looking at, you know, going back for six years, um, you know, our scores are, are, are there. Um, it's just, it's a good slide to look at. And then we'll refer back to the slide. Um, can you, can, we, can you send those to us? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yep, absolutely. The thing I was going to say is you'll see the last couple of years, class of 2021 and 22, that the difference between the 11th grade SAT and the super score is not all that significant compared to earlier years. And that just speaks to a trend that we're noticing that kids just aren't taking the SAT as many times after the, the March okay. SAT day. A lot of kids are just choosing to stick with their one score. Well, some of the schools hold it against them, too. Right. So, I mean, that is why some of them don't take it multiple times. You know, they hold it against them. How do they hold it against them? Wait, no. You're not, you're not allowed to do this. Like, you're not allowed, if you keep taking it, it's not looked upon. I mean, we just started How do they know that? You submit your score. You submit your highest mm -hmm. score. At the admissions level, at the universities? Yeah. You get, you get the highest documents. Right. right. So they either, I didn't think that they knew how many times you took it. It would be different test days, some dates, maybe, on the document. No, because I think, I mean, unless they've changed it. They're only receiving the two highest scores at the university. Yeah, I and mean, this would be where, like, Abby Detour, Mel Balls, the guidance counselor would be better at right. sort of how those scores get reported out to uh, colleges. But, I mean, I can speak to this, like, in October, only 19 seniors took the SAT again um, for whatever reason. So there, there, have, there was a piece in the last couple of years where colleges and universities put a lot less stress on SAT. And they took it to account for pandemic. So, I mean, our guidance counselors would be more apt to talk to that. That's not a trend that's going to, I, I don't think it's going to continue moving forward. Um, but the last couple of years, the universities and colleges have allowed them to take a much more holistic approach to looking at students' transcripts and, and kind of resume coming in, um, which may have played into that as well. And um, many schools are optional, as they do. That's right. And yeah. even very competitive schools that years ago, if, if you weren't 1,300 or higher, you were not going to a Boston college. And now, many of these very competitive schools have made them optional. Yeah. Some schools are taking AC, you know, taking AC AC schools, is, um, as opposed to the SAT score. Um, some students, particularly math and science, tend to be better on the ACT, so they might take that year towards a specific Right. So there's a lot of variables. 
don't meet that, your school is cited. So in general, 95% of every 11th grade class throughout the state takes it, except for the last two years, we have been much higher because many school districts didn't have students in school um, and there was no remote SAT allowed. Where we were in school, so many more of our students took it the last two years than others. So again, scores, and you know, I don't want to make assumptions, but you know, the students that did opt to take the SAT were most of the students that were conscientious in college bound and they wanted those scores. There are a lot of students that did not take the SAT because they were home. There was an option that 95% was, was waived. So the, the scores may have been a little bit inflated from average scores. We take that into account. Um, so another footnote to that is one thing that we opted to do is to contact families who had kids who were remote learners who were juniors and make it available to them to come on and in on the SAT day, take it in an environment where they felt safe, even though they were a remote learner out of the building for the rest of the school year. Okay. And that made significant inroads in us getting to that 95%, mm -hmm. like we always had, even though we had kids that were out. Yeah, we set up other tests for to spread students out more to make sure that they felt safe. We wanted them to come in and get that experience. Well, and, and that is our philosophy, that we try to include everyone so that we are allowing them to provide themselves with opportunities to take it again, even if they're unsure whether or not they will be attending college, because we don't want any child to not provide that opportunity or choice for themselves by not taking it. I mean, I will say that consistently throughout, but particularly the last two years, our special ed participation rate um, more than doubles and triples areas of our school. So we'll refer back to this slide at the end. Um, we, we also want to look at cohort trend data, um, which I think is really important because you know these are students in the, our current 11th graders, how they perform when they were in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. Um, our current 10th graders, we look at how they perform in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade. While it's not the sole predictor of how they're going to do on the SAT, it's important that we have that historical data of each class because each class performs differently. Um, so, you know, Rob gets the data from the eighth grade, it comes in, we break it down, and then we plan to attack based on some of the needs that we see, um, where some of the skills are, are, are uh, strong, where some of the skills are some areas of weakness that we need to improve on, we, we go and attack that. Um, if you look at the 11th grade, um, scores were pretty good. Um, and the PSAT data that we got back a little while ago, um, and we're still kind of, in, and we're still breaking it down. Uh, but the PSAT data for our 11th grade right now is very promising. It looks good, uh, which is which which would match how they performed in middle school. The PSAT data in the 10th grade um, is kind of reflective of, of, of 
there as well. So not, they didn't, you know, it's not as encompassing. So, you know, that it gives us a lot of insight um, on where students, how they're performing historically as a, as a group from sixth grade on. And, you know, we really have the data from third grade on to look at how these classes are, are, are performing. I mean, again, it just gives us, um, and our ninth grade teachers are getting specific data from the eighth grade teachers um, when we have that kind of vertical collaboration going, so they know what students and some of those strengths that they are at. Um, so not the sole predictor, but it's still important to know, you know how students perform historically as a class over time. And then this is something that I really wanted uh, Rob to be here to, to talk about too, because uh, you know, I think our philosophy as educators is always grow. Um, we always believe, you know, students arrive wherever they're at, our goal is to make them stronger um, and, and, and make them better. So um, we look at how students are performing in growth. So Rob, can you speak to, you know, College Board growth report? And yes, this is what it looks like. I think Greg will probably uh, click that link. But um, basically what the College Board will do is it generates a report for us of the students who in 9th, 10th, 11th, and then again for the SAT, they were here with us, they were present, they took the test, um, and they can track growth for those students. So it's a, it's a fair kind of tracking. So we don't, we're basically taking all the absent students out. Um, so you can see when you look at this that, that yes, uh, fall 2019 to fall 2020, so the pandemic hits March 2020, we're out of school for three months, we come back for one month. So that span of time, we, we didn't see the growth that we normally would see, for sure, but if you look at the other areas, we meet and exceed. Um, in most cases, we meet or exceed the benchmark expectations. So the report shows the benchmarks all the way to the right, if you're looking at it, um, for what the expectation is for reading and then for math. And it just goes from you know fall of the freshman year, fall of the sophomore year, fall of the junior year, then the actual SAT day. Um, you know, Again, we were affected by the pandemic, because you can see that we had 122 test takers in freshman year, 121 test takers in the sophomore year, and then 107 in the um, fall of the junior year, which is again, when we just got back into school and we had kids remote, we had kids out of quarantine. So um, that unfortunately affects the number of kids that can get into this report. So 90 out of 122 kids are what who are in the report. Um, but still, I think it's a nice indicator of, of the fact that when kids are with us, when they're present, when they're in school, they are, they are doing what we want them to do in terms of their growth. So if you if, if you look at this, you know, I just, just have a question on that. Oh, uh, did, are the benchmarks pretty much stay, like they stay stagnant year over year over year? Do they do they fluctuate? So yeah, it's just a standard number. So um, for evidence-based reading and writing, it starts at 410, goes to 430, then 460, then 480. So we're looking for 480 as a junior and spring of the junior year. It's slightly higher for math. But the way the College Board does it is they've done their own studies to determine. How would a student, what grade would a student need to get in the freshman year in an entry level class to be successful in college and career ready? And they sort of track it back to what were their SAT scores. And they, they judge it as a C or higher. So a C or higher in an English class, first year writing English class, equates to roughly a 480, according to their studies. Okay. Um, and then for math, it's uh, 530. You know, so, so it is higher. And that's, that's one reason why, from a percentage perspective, why evidence based reading benchmark percentage is consistently higher than math percentage. It's just a higher score um, to achieve. So if you go back, I mean, historically speaking, if you look at it from that, if you just go from the left to the right, you can see each year our students are performing. They're meeting that growth target that Rob just talked about. So that's really you know, an important piece to know, too. The students are coming in, and each year we are seeing improvement in up their athletic grade essence. And I mean, you know, we know we have the action plans that Tracy is going to talk about next. Um, you know, this pandemic, it, it, it was the most serious disruption to students' education probably ever. Um, so Rob is really a master of projections, and that's what he's been doing. We project and we can see, you know, we're, we're going to leave the kids and keep data is got to encourage it. Um, but, you know, it, we have to take into account that seriousness um, over the last year and a half. And, and we don't know what the effect of that may be for a little while. Um, but what we do know is we have all, all I think, the entire administrative team across the district has really targeted specifically for that. We saw that in the action plans. And that's what we're focused on. We're trying to dig in we're, we're, we're you know, keeping mindful of that throughout the year. So, you know, I, I just thought, you know, I, we wanted just a quick opportunity to show you this. And so, you know, if you're new to the board, um, or the question was, you know, historically, you know, this can't be where we're normally at. It's not. Um, but we're at the most abnormal time that we've seen. So, we'll just want to reinforce. 
I just yeah, want to what Greg said too about like the projection for the current junior class is really promising. It looks like we're going to be at pre-pandemic levels for that particular cohort. So that, considering everything that we've gone through, when when we saw that projection, we were really really happy. And I'd mentioned to Tracy too, the freshman scores for math are much higher than they've been in recent years. So, but that our biggest concern is with the sophomore group because they've historically been in a, in a lower situation. So that's what we've really been like. Focusing and this is the same group that when they were in middle school, when we were, like, you know, identified as a school of risk. Right. Now, it was that class. Track through four right. years and working with them. Mm -hmm. so, so what do we offer them? I know there's one elective we could take for SAT prep. Um, but say if you take that, which my son did, to get his sophomore year. So it's been a year since he took that elective, and now he took the, you know, the PSAT again as well. Yeah. Like, he's going to be taking a class, we're going to do it privately, but like, what are we doing to help the kids? I mean, we take one elective. So it's embedded, and I'll let you speak okay. to some of the SAT uh, parts that we do with so, flex and everything well, else. Well, again, and, you know, the, when we talk about the SAT being redesigned, it's redesigned because, you know, what's happening in core academic classes is aligned to what students are going to be seeing on the SAT. It's common core aligned. So there is just in curriculum in, in the core academic areas, you know, there's a lot of you know SAT prep essentially without it being you know blasted as okay SAT direct instruction. We do have a PSAT SAT elective which has been successful. Um, we do have flex time now where students are getting um, interventions on, on a variety of different areas, and we're adding reading lab next year. So we have a, a we're adding a, a, a reading lab. We have a literacy lab this year, science lab. Um, executive functioning lab, uh, math lab. Next year we're going to have the writing lab. Um, so you know that's a focus area that because it's during flex time, like we talked about, I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, we can get any student into that now. Before we were really you know against strong by the schedule, we can get any student in there now. Um, we're going to be offering um, some SAT tips and strategies for all juniors leading up to the SAT during flex time. Now that you know everyone has flex time, um, we're going to offer some of those. Um, strategies. We're working collaboratively as, as teams and, and departments are working to share some strategies that they're seeing successful. Um, we are changing the way that we track our data in our labs. Um, working with um, Heather Porta from um, for the district, but you know, the way that Rob is, is tracking the data with our, our lab teachers, we're just changing the way that, that we kind of track it to be more specific. Um, we met this week as a, as a data team, um, and, and we're breaking it down to students, individual students, and we're really seeing. You know, a group of students that are, are, are low, a group of students that are, are approaching the benchmark, students that are exceeding the benchmark. Our goal is to keep those students exceeding where they are and then target the students that are really just approaching. Um, and I think, you know, our size, our enrollment, five or six students that are, that are almost there, getting those six, seven students over makes it a really uh, noticeable difference in our percentages. So, I mean, we're just, we're doing a lot of things that we normally do. You can see from the last you know, few, we've had success here. We, we, we are successful. This is a unique year, so we're changing some of the ways to attack it to, to meet those needs um, in many different formats. Um, I don't know if you want to add to that. I know that Tracy's going to speak to some of the action plan items, so this might come up with that too. But when the data team met on the 10th of December, the biggest thing we did is we took name, like actual, so this is like the average scores, but we identify names of students in each grade who are really close to benchmark, um, and we say, and we put them on a list, and we give it to all of the department leaders, and we say, let's identify which kids would benefit from an intervention, and which type of intervention would they benefit from the most. So is it a lab environment? Is it a PSAT, SAT prep class? Is it a quick, we're going to pull you in for a couple months before the SAT and hit it in flex? So that's all the kind of conversations that are happening right now with that list of students, especially the juniors. Um, because we know those are the ones that um, we have to hit right before March. We also do an analysis, what we call the question analysis report, which we can look at every single question on the PSAT that was given and look for trends in terms of performance. So we notice, for example, that our students are struggling with like standard English conventions, punctuation. That's a really quick thing that we can in the English department do right before they take the, the PSAT, which we plan to do. We, we typically do that anyway, but it was like, a real reinforcement of like, yes, this is something that we can really, like a quick hitting thing. We also noticed that they struggled with um, questions related to uh, analysis and science. Um, and so we you know, talked to Megan Redman and Ryan Dabrowski, the Department of Social Science, and said this is something you need to be aware of. Um, now those sorts of things change year over year, but 
you know, it's in, that's a really powerful tool to be able to say to clearly the teachers, focus on this skill, you know, as a big quick hitting kind of thing. And that is a very nice segue into the update of the action plans. Because what I'm going to speak to this evening really is about what we have done for the, what these action plans are built on is addressing students' needs. So when we were charged and the building administrators, myself, their teams all went back and started looking at what, do we, what needs to happen in our buildings to help students move forward. And the truth is they all need individual intervention or individualized learning, which obviously research well shows that this is exactly what schools should be doing. But before this year for many of the buildings and many of the departments, it's been unrealistic. With the addition of flex time in the schedule at the high school, now they have a vehicle, as they mentioned, to make sure every kid receives the services that they need. So for instance, students in the math lab and the reading lab before, if you didn't have a study hall while the person that was teaching the lab was teaching it, you could not attend. Now we can make those recommendations and referrals in real time. Mm -hmm. Meaning if when we get this PSAT data, because everyone in the building is available for that same period of time, we can, if we need to make three labs um, of, of various content to make sure students get it. And as we go on, those things will become more targeted and more specific. So we will have one for ninth graders, for 10th graders, at, particularly with math, much of the biggest jump in math is between junior, sophomore and junior year, and really between junior PSAT and the junior spring school day SAT, because that's algebra two, and there's a large set of discrete skills and content that students don't see until then. So it's tested on the PSAT, but students haven't even had the opportunity to learn it yet. So we are then able to start to address those kids differently than we would the sophomores or the freshmen. So in each of the updates, and when we look through it, the focus is that response to intervention. Whether it be students electing to take an SAT course or us enrolling them in labs um, with the recommendations of teachers as well as academic achievement data. In the elementary schools, we are starting three-step processes. So at Jerome, it's a three-step inquiry process that the PLCs are going through, which is actually a data process where we look at student success or areas in need of improvement. We design strategies as teachers and professional learning communities that we believe will work. We then have them go through this and then on the next assessment, see how the students are doing and really look to target to see which students are responding to which interventions and which strategies are most appropriate. And then we have obviously those that don't succeed. We try additional strategies with. But while we're doing all this and, and really is the push of the state of Connecticut is that you still need to move forward. Right. So these students right. need to be addressed during these special times, whether it be RTI or elementary schools or flex. And that's what these action plans speak to right now. This is new, the way we're doing it is new. So really it's about establishing these RTI structures for the first time ever. Um, we have someone who's specifically working to help the buildings develop those structures and make sure the district has a sequential, comprehensive system of response to intervention pre-K to 12. And that is Heather Porto. She is through her position, she's a formal special ed teacher in the district, and she is in this position based on one of the grants in which accelerating learning was one of the priorities that the state had set forth. Yeah. So it is her position to, to integrate herself with each of the, the integrate herself with each of the data teams and look how she can help them most efficiently determine students' needs and address them. So as I mentioned, Jerome and TBS are, and TBS is doing a three question PLC protocol where they're asking questions within their professional learning communities. Um, Jerome is doing the same thing, but it is in the, in the, in the vehicle in form of a three step inquiry protocol. 
The high school and middle school both have their own inquiry protocols that they engage in, and it's all about tracking these students and seeing what works and doesn't work. For example, in the latest data meeting at the high school, uh, Heather and I were present, and their team was talking about what happens to students before they enter a lab, as they test at the end of the lab, and then after the lab. And we did start to see that some of the students, after they're done with lab support for the quarter, and they scored well enough to move on and to be out of that and do some of their own choice activities during flex, that sometimes the scores start to slip. So, and, and that is most common in special education students, which is not, um, I would think, it really doesn't shock any of us to understand that. So the conversations we start to have are things like, Okay, so what is the collaboration that happens between the resource special ed teacher and the lab teacher to talk about that child specific and what strategies worked? So then that resource teacher can now start to integrate those strategies into the work the resource teacher is doing with the student to complete work. So not only about teaching the strategy, but now about using it in every day. So those are, in each of the buildings, that is the main work being done right now. So in every building, we're also doing observations and professional development to make sure all the things that we're talking about are happening. But most importantly, it's about creating these structures because they are new, and even where they existed in some way, they are very different. So what we will be doing, and, and it will be more formal moving forward as we start to talk about a structure, and once mid-year benchmarks are in, which is next month, we'll have a different type of update, but I will be able to address specific cells within the updates and in within the action plans. And once we figure out exactly what that looks like and how detailed we're going to be, then we'll do presentations on it. Thank you. Any questions? Well, I, my question is, I mean, did you say it's fair to say that most of these action plans are for people who, for the students that are below or just about benchmark, or is it? You, you action plans are, are about, so the goal of an action plan, whether it is specifically defined that way, is to improve student achievement, period. So, yes, it, do, we, do we tend to make a more differentiated version of supports for students that are below grade level, we do. Um, and sometimes that's legally our responsibility when it comes to special education. And quite honestly, even response to intervention, which is for usually for your general education students, is a requirement by law. Um, anything past seventh grade is a plan, we're a, a success plan, and we go from there. But no, it's more than that. So with FLEX, we are allowed to also have the students that are above grade level grouped together. So I will say, so when I look at some of the great things that teachers love the most in their content area, with the shift and change in standards and shifts from grade level, that doesn't always get to happen in their course anymore. So for instance, general, um, the next generation science standards does not cover the the standards that would be manifested in hatching chickens. But it's a great experiment. It obviously lends itself to quite a few things, including genetics in middle school science. So, but for students that aren't able to meet the minimum benchmarks of science, that's really not something they need to focus on. But for your students that are already there, they are going to a teacher's classroom during that flex or intervention time, and that is what they're focusing on. So they're being able to expand and enhance their experiences and choose, quite honestly, independent projects. So one of those things, and I'm actually, Jen Tetzo leads the capstone project at high school. She's going to present during my, a brief presentation during my segment of the meeting next month. Um, to show you at the high school, all seniors are required to do a capstone. Mm -hmm. um, it is a graduation requirement that will eventually manifest it into a performance assessment that the state requires. But it's choice, and, and how sophisticated their projects are, how complex the work they do within that really is based on their own level. So she'll be here next week to explain some of that. And eventually, that is the goal to move through every grade. 
um, and, and we obviously started with our most mature, right. because when it comes to self-choice and self-directed learning, it is best, obviously, if right. students have a maturity level that allows them to understand the seriousness and the importance of it. Thank you. So it is for everyone, but there we absolutely do have more differentiated supports for the students that are below level. Well, we're looking at we're looking at everything. And you hear the appropriate thing that we um, talked about following the meeting. I had a preliminary discussion with Mrs. Moon and Mrs. Stadio and the department chair for math. And typically, when Common Core came to be, we all, always scheduled and offered help to one daily. You know, the high school classes meet every other day. You heard Mrs. Moon speak about the rigors of um, the math piece on the SAT and the benchmark being so high. We're starting a preliminary discussion. What, what would it look like if we do with this staff that exists, so no cost to, to anyone, if sometime during the school year we use the same staff to have out for two daily, in addition, different times of the year out for one daily, because that SAT comes up for junior year. Uh, that would impact every single junior, whether they're in an honors level, a general level, college prep level, that could be impactful helping kids get ready for that SAT. So there's no stone unturned. That's a real concrete example of how we want to help every single day. Right. So those are discussions that we're in, and obviously those discussions then become what, it, what it are the costs? What are the implications for students? So by keeping the number of credits between Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 the same, staffing would not be the issue. So we are, um, again, very preliminary. But we are having these discussions because the truth is, if we can do freshmen a credit and a half, meaning they go one half of the year every day, Right now, they go every day for the full year. And for Algebra 2, have those students meet every day for the first half of the year, and then every other day for the second half, they would get a, a much more of the content of Algebra 2, which the heart of Algebra is the focus of SAT. Um, a, I wouldn't say majority, but it is a large focus of the SAT math. And, and they would have the opportunity to do it there. And we have found through item analysis that some of our highest achieving students who take algebra one in the elementary, in the middle school, um, are having difficulty on some of the questions that are solely housed in algebra one. So the topics that are solely housed in algebra one, if you haven't taken it since eighth grade year, um, they're losing it. So we are looking at ways to address those. So again, we're looking at student data and creative ways to help students based on that data. Okay, uh, we will send the um, PowerPoint out to you. If you have any questions from any of the PowerPoint information or anything that was discussed, just send that back. I want to thank Mr. Ford for being here tonight and presenting. Um, I hope it was informative and helpful for you, and we'll go from there. Obviously, moving on to the board agenda, our COVID update. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Our current numbers uh, to date, we've had five positive cases for staff, 58 for students. Uh, I mean, weekly uh, with the COVID team in the district and East Shore Health uh, and emergency services, and we talk about trends and where we're at and what we're doing. And uh, our administrators and our nurses have done a wonderful job working with uh, the new guidelines and keeping students in school uh, based upon the new guidelines. Uh, making sure that uh, we only quarantine when we absolutely have to uh, and we're still uh, keeping with our safety protocols to minimize those numbers. So that's going well. Um, the Augur House uh, invitations have been set for Monday. I hope you'll be able to t attend on the 20th at 1030. We're really proud of everything that uh, John Florio, Franny Marola, uh, the team, Bob Drow have worked really hard with uh, in collaboration with getting that to be a state-of-the-art special education um, set up for our so 18 exciting. to 22 year olds. It's absolutely gorgeous. When you drive by at night tonight, take a look at it. It's, it's decorated, it's lit up. Uh, it's something we can all be very proud of and we can't wait to cut the ribbon on Monday. Uh, legal services, we're not going to discuss tonight. That's something that we're continuing to uh, investigate and as we get more into the budget season, we'll, we'll uh, talk about that. 
There are no town manager pending requests other than I'll tell you we paved 27 spots in front of the high school uh, where we had to move uh, cars from the intermediate school because we're moving some fencing. That was part of the process to do some underground work for electrical and uh, sewer setup. So we knew this was going to be coming. There was a great collaboration with our uh, with Franny and Public Works again to work with our administration at the middle of the high school to make sure that uh, we had safe places for uh, the faculty to park and get into our buildings and it worked out really well. So kudos to everyone for their efforts. Sure. On the legal services, what's the deadline for that? There, there is, is no deadline. deadline. We, don't we, have have no. we have attorneys on staff. Right? Yeah. We have them on staff, but yes. The idea is to consolidate. Yes. So there's no deadline. So there is no deadline. I didn't know if we had a contract no. coming to a close. Okay. No. Um, with the parking lot, with the new paving, I noticed in the, the student parking lot that um, they have lost some spots, I guess, so they're all putting on the grass, like along the fence. Is that something we should pave, or we just you know, let them park in the grass? I don't know. Like, Yeah, I'm not going to get it. They did put some process down to even it out with that. Okay. Box, so it, there is a process. Um, those are just some new spots so the students can park there. You know, just get some additional parking try to help them out. Yeah, I mean, I don't blame them for parking on the grass. I mean, no. they can't no, get yeah, it, so, it's, but... It's a proof that they can do that. Yeah, we I know. Worked, that we worked yeah. with um, John okay. and Fran on that to make sure that it was okay. We would even out. Uh, the only time that they can't park there, which we told them, is during the winter when we get the plow. Right. Okay. So we're working with the fire marshal as well because obviously we have parking capacity based yeah. on the size of the building and the number. So we're, we're dealing with all of that. But we're doing what we can to accommodate as many as we can. So, uh, renovation project is going well. We're ahead of schedule. Uh, we uh, have seen a lot of the concrete poured. We reported on that. Now, segue over to Beth. If there's anything that you want to share, uh, no. Beth. <laughs> um, no. For the east wind, the special pouring the wall soon. Is it? Very well. We have some very lively conversations <laughs> in our That's an understatement, but I understand that more than um, But it's all for saving the town money and sure. saving our money wisely. And coming up with the best possible high school. And I, I want I want to thank um, the committee for going back to the council when they see something that we need to do for the long term that may cost a little bit more. But with a project of this magnitude, we don't want to short cut anything because we know what happens with the roof when you get a poor design and then we have to go back and put money into it so we're trying to avoid that. I guess so we can thank the, the, the uh, North Brantford Intermediate School project because it's showing us, showing us what we don't want to do here. There are more ways. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're not making the same mistakes twice. Do it, do it right one time. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. yeah. Do it right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And we'll fix MBS. All right. Uh, thank you. Committee reports, uh, I'll turn that over to see what we have for reports. Nothing for negotiations, right? We're done with everything till done the with fall. Everything. Well, we'll probably start in August for the teachers, July or August. Right. Right? That's our next for teachers. Yep. Uh, budget and operations, no meeting. Curriculum, we had it tonight. Pension, no meeting. Policy, no meeting. ACES. ACES did have a meeting, but I did not attend. Okay. So. Thank you. Um, building committee, we just took care of. Communication, no meeting. Um, any new business? Um, should we take out the curriculum and instruction thing? If it's going to be part of this main board meeting, we really don't need to have it, it was, was there. It was asked, and I, and I think it might have been shown it during a discussion that we should leave it just in case there's something that would take up a little too much time in this meeting okay. and you would want to meet separately for it. That's fine. Totally fine. Um, new business, there's nothing. Visitors and press. Go to the board. Anybody have anything to say? Uh, I mean, I just went by the Auger House. Um, I go out by every day and drop my son off at Jerome. It looks wonderful, so I just want to comment how, I mean, it really was impressive looking, and it's nice to see the building used, yeah. and I'm looking forward to the kids being in the building, so, or the young adults being in the building. Absolutely. Not really kids anymore. So. Schools, the schools are very busy. I read the briefs. They're very busy. Um, kudos to all the schools for keeping as many things going as we have going, considering the pandemic and, and, and everything else. And the fundraisers that they did were amazing. Thank you, guys. 
And I hope everybody has a nice holiday. Safe and healthy holiday. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. So the next regular Board of Education meeting is scheduled for Thursday, January 20th, 2022. Motion to adjourn? Second. Or motion to adjourn, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Janet and Beth, give whoever you want, first and second. All in favor? Aye. Perfect. Thanks, everyone.